Let's get it all! What's cracking, fight fans? And just like that, we are back with another edition of What I Got Right and What I Got Wrong, presented to you by Comments from the Peanut Gallery. This week, this segment is brought to you by Colorado Native Company. If you are in the need for any sort of HVAC services or products, be sure to hit up my man, Robbie, with Colorado Native Company. Let him know that the Peanut Gallery sent you, and you will be all taken care of. Now, this week's matchup at UFC 270 in the main event was a colossal clash of two titans between the undisputed champion and the interim champion, Francis Ngannou, taking on Surreal Gone. We have never seen a matchup like this in the history of the heavyweight division between two guys who are not just elite fighters, but also elite athletes. To put it fairly, someone said it great last night i believe it was one of the tweets that popped up on the on the broadcast but if these two guys were american or grew up in america they'd be playing football which i think is a fair assessment both these guys are international based fighters and uh, you had them walking around looking like they're carved out of stone at six four six five 250 plus pounds so that uh that i think was a very very accurate assessment by somebody out there when we're taking a look at what I got right as far as this matchup goes, Surreal's understanding of range and distance created problems for Francis to land consistently. Francis is willing to risk it for the biscuit, and at times he's going to end up out of position because he throws everything but the kitchen sink into some of those bombing shots. Now, he has a chin and he's confident in his ability to take those shots, and it's because when he does throw everything into these long overhands or some of these booming punches that, that just aren't necessarily the most technically astute, when they land, they're highlight reels. They're like the NFT that he walked around on his chest throughout fight week. They're something that attracts the masses to want to see Francis fight, but that's also, something in that respect, what I got wrong. I thought that if Francis was going to win this fight, that he was going to win this fight by knockout. The structural integrity of Francis' knee was compromised. This was not something that we knew going into the fight. That played a factor in Francis' ability to successfully stalk and approach Surreal down on the feet. Now, he was physically not able to use his full set of tools on the feet, so, in my opinion, he showed impressive adaptive resilience to be able to solve the equation that was right there in front of him. When you have a nimble guy who's able to bounce around a lot the way that Surreal can, but you, A, don't want to expend the energy to chase him down, essentially, and B, you cannot fight your normal fight standing up due to the injury, you do exactly what Francis did, and you put that man on his back. The KO highlights are... Always fantastic. The knockouts, don't get me wrong, those are what puts a lot of cheeks in seats. But I think that this may have been one of Francis Ngannou's most impressive performances, all things considered, based off of the way that he was able to show all of that growth and evolution. That's something I'll get into in the next video segment. In the co-main event between Davison Figueiredo and Brandon Moreto. Now, what I got right in this matchup was that Moreno was going to be able to push the pace and he was going to put the pressure onto Figueiredo throughout the entirety of the contest. Figueiredo's performance was going to be largely based off of how well his body was going to respond to the cut and the rehydration process. We know that he's had issues with this in the past. Him and his team, Henry Cejudo and company, had him so well prepared for this that when he stepped on the scales, he stepped on the scales at 124 pounds and he had a lot of energy while doing so. There was a lot of bounce and pep in his step during that process. The pop in Figueredo's hands is always going to be a threat and that was something that I think probably was a difference factor on the judges' scorecards, especially when we're taking a look at the third round when he was seemingly losing all of that round all the way up into the point to where he was able to knock Moreno down and then finished in a dominant position for that round. He got the decision, the 48-47 win, meaning that it was three rounds to two. I thought that the fight was extremely close. Personally, I thought that it was a Moreno win, three rounds to two, but it was a tight fight, and I'm not going to go and throw the word robbery out there. I think that that gets overused when there's tight fights. It was a tough fight between two guys, and 
Yeah, you could very definitely make the case that Figueredo won that fight. He put Moreno to the canvas a couple of times, whether it was from foot sweeps to leg kicks to punches. So that being said, I would love to see them run it back for a fourth time. We really don't see a quadruple fight or a quadrology. I don't know if that's the right exact word based off of trilogy, if you will. But being that the series currently is 1-1-1, one, one, and one, I don't think that it's out of the realm of possibility to want to see that fight. Seems like both uh, both the champion in Figueiredo as well as the now soon-to-be challenger and back into the contender ranks in Brandon Moreno both want to run that one back to see who is the top dog in this series between them. And I'm not mad at him. I would love to see it again. That was an incredible fight. The pace that those two put on each other for 25 minutes was incredible. Everything that was your money's worth, and for that matter, what their initial figures were on paper as reported by CSAC, that's not enough, man. Those guys deserve more, and they're going to get more than what that figure is, which is somewhat misleading. Some people are going to be jumping all over the UFC scene what those numbers were, but there is going to be pay-per-view points, especially for somebody like a Brandon Moreno. If we take a look at the feature fight of the night in Michelle Pajeda against Andre Fialio. Now, what I got right in this matchup was that I said Pajeda was extremely explosive. He is dangerous at any point of the fight while he still has that energy. And his ability to manage that energy and selectively choose his sprints and his bursts would be the determinant factor of whether or not he got his hand raised or not. At his age, at him being, still being a young guy on the better side of 30 that way, with him having more than 40 professional fights, he's got a considerable experience advantage when it came to fighting a guy who was making his UFC debut in Andre Fialio. I knew that Fialio was going to be well-prepared coming out of Sanford and that his boxing and straight punches was going to be an advantage against someone who's a little bit wild and likes to throw some looping shots as well as a bunch of spinning attacks the way that Pajeda does, but... What I got wrong in this matchup was that I thought that Pajeda was going to be able to use some of those dynamic movements and his creativity to find the knockout based on the way that vets like Chris Curtis and Chidi and Jukwani were able to against Fialio. Now, I think maybe I let a little bit of my own personal bitterness toward Fialio cloud my judgment as far as what he was going to bring in the cage. He shows that he belongs in the UFC. My personal vendetta extends to a couple of summers ago. He was supposed to fight my boy, my teammate, my coach in Austin Jones, and we had just got done wrapping up, cutting weight for the night, and we get the call probably like 11.30, somewhere in there. We were He was set to fly out the next morning to make everything official, and we got the call that Fialio pulled out for a non-COVID-related illness. It was, I guess, probably more than anything, just some bitterness and some annoyance that we were that deep into the process, and... The plug was pulled and the opportunity was taken away from my boy Austin. So, either way, Fialio showed that he was uh, that he was prepared and that he does belong to be in the UFC. Syed Nurmagomedov taking on Cody Stamen. Now, what I got right with this matchup, I said that Syed Nurmagomedov is a legit Dagestani savage whose only loss in the UFC was to Howney Barcelos, who is another killer in that stacked bantamweight division. Even though he's never lost by one before, I do know that that's a little bit of a vulnerability for Cody Stamen just based off of anecdotal talk from, uh, you know, from guys that have trained with him and and also from from seeing him train. You know, it's just sometimes those guys who are strong wrestlers, they'll leave their head in a predicament and those guys who have the ability to pounce on a throat are going to take advantage. What I got wrong was that I said Cody is Midwest tough and he's hard to finish because the only time up to this point in his professional career that he had been finished was by the current champion, Aljamain Sterling, who caught him in a knee bar a couple of years ago. If that's the only time that you've actually truly been submitted and finished, I don't think that I was wrong in having that take going into the fight, but Cody himself said on his Instagram today, quote unquote, that he took a shit on pay-per-view. Hey, sometimes it'd be like that in the cage, and Cody will bounce back. He's a competitor. He's got a good head on his shoulders, and he'll he'll find his way back to getting his hand raised. I know that he's on a little bit of a skid right now, and that confidence may not necessarily be at a high, but 
at this point, you just got to think that, you know, throw you, – you have nothing to lose now at this point. You, you could potentially uh, three in a row be looking at, you know, fighting for fighting for an opportunity to keep, keep your spot on the roster, which I think that he 100% deserves to be there. Let's just say that. But we just know by the numbers when you have that sort of skid, sometimes the, uh, the UFC doesn't take too kindly to that. Now he does have a great manager in Jason House that I think is going to figure out the right opportunity for him to potentially get himself back in that winner's circle and get things turned around. In the opening fight of the main card, we had the young 22-year-old in Michael Morales taking on the longtime now veteran in the UFC of Trevin Giles. Now, what I got right as far as this matchup goes was Morales truly is a phenom at just 22 years old and undefeated. The kid is dangerous absolutely everywhere. Trevin Giles fancies himself a boxer, and he does get touched, though. He got TKO'd in a sequence in his last fight that started with a right hand, and I don't, I didn't think coming into this fight that him taking another 15 pounds off of the frame, 15 pounds of water, and just that weight that comes off of the brain, I did not see that as being an advantage for him in this situation. He got clipped again with another right hand that ultimately led to the finish, and that's where I also lead to what I got wrong with this matchup, and that I thought that Trevin Giles, with his experience, with him being an eight-time USC veteran that has a resume and a schedule that boasts lots of highly respected veterans, gritty veterans at that, I thought that that would allow him to show some veteran savviness to pull out some tricks and to outlast, or at least make it a lot tougher on the 22-year-old rookie in the UFC. He made the rookie mistake against the rookie. Trevin Giles had Morales hurt with the right hand early on in that first round, but rather than staying back or staying in range and being a sniper using that boxing prowess, he decided to pounce on Morales and initiate a clinch sequence. In turn, that allowed Morales to be able to recover, which effectively allowed him to get his bearings back and then unload that counter right hand that led to the finish. Just not a smart move on Giles' end right there. Moving along to the prelims and the feature prelim, hey, that was everything that you could have imagined or everything that you could have wanted as a fight fan, watching a guy like Victor Henry coming in there, a a longtime veteran who was just waiting on the chance, 34 years old, training underneath the war master in Josh Barnett, formerly known as the babyface assassin, was the earliest heavyweight champion in UFC history, blah, blah, blah. You can go down the resume of the uh, of the prestige of Josh Barnett himself. But taking a look at this and what I got right, I said that Onan Barcelos is fast, and the way that he dips and finds some of his striking angles is Aldo-esque. But again, at 27 pro fights, Victor Henry has a lot of cage time, and in those 27 fights, he has... A steady mix or a healthy mix of bright young prospects like Kyler Phillips. He has a finish against UFC vet and Anderson Dos Santos back on the regional level. And then he has experience against veterans in organizations like Ryzen, like Masanori Kenaha, who has damn near 50 fights. What I got wrong as far as this matchup goes was that Barcelo's speed would be too much to handle. It wasn't. Henry showed that he belongs in the UFC and that this call is probably overdue now at this point. He, at his age and with the technical skill that he showed, proved that he's basically a plug-and-play option in a pretty stacked division in that Bantamweight division. I'm looking forward to seeing what may be next for Victor Henry. That's now two in a row that Howney Borcellos has dropped, so I, I don't know. I think that he's probably he's probably got to go back and get some of these things solved to get himself back into the winner's circle again. You never want to go three on a three-fight skid. It's just one of those unfortunate predicaments of, uh, of your job potentially being on the line at that point once you're in the UFC. Jack Della Maddalena against Pete Rodriguez. I got nothing wrong as far as this fight goes. Now, all due respect to Rodriguez, he got his ass whipped plain and simple. At only 25, though, he's got some room to grow, and he can make the improvements. I think he's a little bit short and thick as far as his frame goes for the division, so maybe his future is at 155 and not 170. In terms of what I got right, 
Rodriguez was a sacrificial lamb that was led to the slaughterhouse. At only 4-0 with all four of his fights coming against guys without much respective experience, which is understandable because he was only at 4-0 in his pro career, but he had never been into deep waters. He had never had to get past that first round to really dig deep and test his grit. And him going in there against a guy who has more than three times the amount of professional experience with a 90% finish rate was going to be an issue. De La Maddalena is an assassin on the feet, and the only reason why he was in this position was because his original opponent was a 13-fight vet in Worley Alves, and he was the last-second pullout. That's what gave Rodriguez the opportunity. There's a reason why De La Maddalena was supposed to fight a guy who is as game and experienced as Worley Alves. Outside of a lucky bomb connecting, there was no chance that Rodriguez was going to make it out of there without taking considerable damage against a guy who is as sound and as dangerous in the striking game as De La Maddalena. The way that Jack was able to stick that jab was beautiful. He busted up the nose early on against Rodriguez, and he was just able to continue to just boom, just pat, 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 just finding his opening. And, and at times, I mean, we were counting. He was, it seemed like he was landing upwards of 60, 70 plus percent as far as those strikes that he was throwing. It was, uh, it was an impressive debut for him, although, you know, it may not be the best game age as far as the strength of competition in Rodriguez I'll do respect him once again but yeah at, at only being 4-0 I think that Della Maddalena did exactly what he was supposed to do against the person who they put in front of him all you can do is beat who they put out in front of you following that fight we had Tony Gravely taking on Simon Oliveira now what I got right coming into this matchup was I said that Oliveira is a guillotine specialist and Gravely's propensity to shoot for the takedown relentlessly may end up with him getting caught especially if he's not smart with his head positioning or isn't quick to clear the legs and pass and Gravely is also he's he's a grinder he's a guy who can push the pace with his wrestling style and He can just wear you down with time. Now, he's had many high-level, tough, tough opponents dating all the way back to his second pro fight when he fought Pat Sabatini. I think that all of those things combined, his conditioning, his style, and his experience against these type of vets that I'm about to name off were all factors in him ultimately being able to find his way out of bad positions and get his hand raised last night. Now, Some of his other fights on the local and regional scene before he got to the UFC, who do you ask? Those were Marab Davalishlili. You had Ricky Bandejas, Manny Bermudez, Draco Rodriguez, Chris Moutinho, and Ray the Judge Rodriguez. Once again, you pair that experience along with his four trips to the Octagon after getting his ticket punch to the UFC by winning in the Contender Series. It's a tough one for a guy in his debut. What I got wrong in this matchup was I said that a few bucks on Oliveira might be worth the flyer. Didn't play out, but again, I think that based off of the the styles and the the pros and cons from each of them, it wasn't a bad thing. There was a couple of deep guillotine attempts, but ultimately, again, if you bet on that, throw your money down the drain. That's on me. Matt Favola taking on Gennaro Valdez. What I got right with this one was I said that Favola is a solid vet with... Again, a tough strength of schedule. He's already had multiple fights within the UFC, and that experience is going to play a considerable advantage in this matchup against a debutant. I also think that Frivola probably thought that he was a little bit backed into a corner off of the two losses that he recently sustained, one of them being that uh, that debut highlight real record-breaking performance from Terrence McKinney. So I think that he thought that, you know, there may be the chance that me dropping two in a row, if I drop a third, might be my job on the line. And he went out there and he hit Valdez with some hard shots early on, dropped him a couple of times and was ultimately able to secure the TKO. What I got wrong was that I thought Valdez's impressive finish rate shows that he's a game opponent and that he has some considerable threats to give respect to while he's out there. And, and he walked forward through a lot of things, but... He just wasn't able to present anything that gave Frivola the type of issues that he's been able to put in front of other guys so far in his career. Little monster. Vanessa Demopoulos taking on Silvana Gomez-Juarez. 
what I got right in this fight was so that Silvana has pop in her hands, but it's going to be tough for Vanessa to get finished just because she truly is a little monster when it comes to her conditioning and her chin paired with that heart that she's exuded time and time again throughout her career. She's taken some damage in those wars that she had while she was in the LFA where she became a champion in a fight where Sam Hughes was putting it on her. And then in the championship round, she was able to pull off that inverted triangle. In her UFC debut against J.J. Aldrich, J.J. Aldrich was putting it on her, and she did not go down throughout the fight. She got beat up, but she was never finished throughout that contest. Vanessa's never been finished as a pro. The only time that she's met that fate was to the number two ranked flyweight, Caitlin Chikagian, all the way back in 2013, nine years ago when they were both amateurs. Vanessa's jiu-jitsu I knew would be a major advantage coming into this matchup if it were to hit the ground. Even after she got flashed, I knew it was a wrap as soon as she got the overhook. Someone like Vanessa who has that armbar just mastery within her skill set, that's her favorite submission, she's drilled this countless times now at this point to where that sequence is just muscle memory. It's a base jiu-jitsu fundamental principle that you do not want to put your hands on the mat. And this is precisely why. As soon as Silvana had her arm down on the mat, Vanessa secured the overhook, which led to the start of the armbar with her hand being tucked into the armpit. Didn't necessarily have the thumb high, but then as soon as Vanessa's corner called for the uh, called for the sweep, she executed the sweep masterfully and then was able to break the grip of Silvana and secured the armbar. In the curtain jerker, we had... Jasmine Jasudavicius taking on Kay Hansen. Now, what I got right in this matchup was I said that Jasudavicius would be physically strong and able to carry the pace along with having that reach advantage. Going to be a factor against someone like Kay Hansen who is, is coming into a new weight class up from 115 pounds. And that the, the reach was a factor throughout different ports, points of the fight. I knew that Hansen was going to be tough. Because she's always just shown that that she has she has grit to her, but I also thought that there might be some time that she needs to make some adjustments. Being that she's a only twenty two years old, and that she is moving up to a new weight class and adjusting to carrying more mass on her frame, I thought that Jasmine would be able to control the positioning, especially up against the fence and through the grappling exchanges with her on top, just because she's coming out of a predominantly wrestling-based camp. I also thought that it was going to be safe money to bet the over in this matchup. What I got wrong was that I thought that Jasmine may have some of those debut jitters, and there's a potential for an adrenaline dump, especially going up against Kay Hansen in her home crowd. But that just didn't happen that way. What did you guys think as far as the card goes? What do you think of my take and my analysis and what we got right and what we got wrong? Thank you for tuning in for this week's edition of What I Got Right, What I Got Wrong by Comments from the Peanut Gallery. I'm Jordan Kurtz. This segment this week has been brought to you by Colorado Native Company. Quick question for everybody out there. Who enjoys getting injured after taking a pop to the chops? Well, as someone who spends multiple hours per week speaking into a microphone, I know I don't. And I especially don't have the time to be making unnecessary trips and visits to the dentist's office. That's why I trust my oral protection needs to Impact Mouthguards. Impact Mouthguards offers custom molded, custom fit solutions for everything from mixed martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to powerlifting and nighttime products. Impact Mouthguards merchandise lineup offers things for both the badass beauties and the bearded badasses out there. Everything from rash guards and t-shirts to stickers and finger tape. Make sure that you check out www.impactmouthguards.com. Use the promo code PEANUTGALLERY in the checkout. Now we're going to talk about a new segment that we're starting this week. It's called Afterthoughts. This Afterthoughts segment is brought to you by Fat Ninja Combat Gear for some dope original fightwear based fashion make sure that you go to www.fatninjacombatgear.com and pick yourself up a new fit today they've got a, a drop that just came out based off of squid game so super dope original artwork and some cool colors with those outfits so again make sure that you check out www.fatninjacombatgear.com and pick yourself up a new outfit support small business and someone who is a part of our mma community out there Talking afterthoughts with this last weekend, there's, this was arguably Francis Ngannou's most impressive performance to date. Now, again, 
It wasn't one of those highlight reel knockouts that most were expecting, but in my opinion, the growth and the evolution that he showed in his game was tremendous. The work that he's put in out there with Coach Eric Nixick at Extreme Couture is very evident. His knee was severely compromised coming into the fight, so he also could not fight that same fight on the feet that we're typically accustomed to seeing Francis fight. I believe that he showed some incredible adaptive resiliency to not let Surreal's movement be the difference maker in the contest, and he was able to then take control of the fight as it went on by putting Surreal on his back multiple times. Francis's offensive wrestling was on display last night. It's something that we have not seen from him yet so far. It's been talked about from people around him in his camp throughout some interviews, but it's something that we have been yet to see to this point. That body slam heard around the world, I think is going to be a highlight that will be always played now in his reel going forward. Francis also showed that he has some jujitsu up his sleeve. When Surreal went for the leg lock, which personally I think at that stage of the fight was a mistake, it was late on, also so sweaty at that point, and with someone who is as strong as Francis, it proved that it, it was uh, it just wasn't the, the right time for that attack. Francis, as soon as he started to see that heel hook get formulated or the grip get formulated, he said, fuck your heel hook, bitch, stood right up and worked his way out of danger. Francis was scary to begin with. Now that we add a Francis who has added grappling and more conditioning to the arsenal, That's a scary dude. But that being said, with all due respect, the man that we saw in the cage last night has no business being in a boxing ring with Tyson Fury. Again, it's all due respect to Francis and outside of a massive payday, that in no way would ever go well, in my opinion, going up against a guy like Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury was just way too fast, and in just boxing, taking away all the rest of the tools, it just would not be a good night for Francis. Skill for skill, like I say, it's it's not tough. I think that it's also a damn shame that John Jones cannot keep his shit together for long enough to be able to be there cage side for an event of that magnitude. John Jones should have been their cage side to then be called into the cage after the fight for a face-off with the winner. John was active on Twitter last night, and he said that he's excited about getting back in there and breaking more records at heavyweight. He also at one point said, "Ah, I might just stay in retirement, but we all know that John wants to continue to fight. I think that John is a nightmare opponent for Francis. I just think that we've it's it's already amongst most fight fans, John is arguably the GOAT. Obviously, there's a lot of things or a lot of asterisks to John's career, but what John has actually been able to do in the cage is undisputed. To cap this all off, how pissed off was Dana White? Really, seriously. How pissed off was the boss? Because Dana took off early and did not choose to wrap the belt around Francis Ngannou's waist, nor did he show up to the press conference after the fight. Mick Maynard wrapped the belt around Francis' waist, and I think that it's, uh, with him being such a fixture, talking to the media and at these press conferences, whether he is happy or angry, I think that's pretty telling. Now, you know damn well that if Surreal won the fight, that it would have been Dana in there wrapping the belt around Surreal's waist. The back and forth between Dana and Francis is no secret at this point. And if we look at examples of the past, like say the infamous Anderson Silva fight over in Abu Dhabi years ago, where Dana was Dana Pink, he was livid. He still took to the podium and did not forego the chance to talk to the media and go full scorched earth in the process. So again, I think that him choosing to not do that is very telling about how the boss felt. One, about the winner. Two, in terms of how that fight went. Yeah, I I think that there's still going to be some hurdles to overcome between Dana and Francis' team to put things back in the good graces and get things back on the right track. 
what do I think is next for Francis? I think that Francis should fight John Jones next. Plain and simple. I don't think that there's any other any other real option out there. I would love to see in turn. I would love to see Cyril fight Stipe Miocic. Stipe is a guy who has kind of not been on a whole lot of conversations or not been on the front burner for getting back into that fold. But he's the greatest heavyweight champion in the history of the UFC. So I think that for him to get a potential opportunity or a nod to get back into that circle or to get back into title contention is going to need a fight like a surreal or I wouldn't mind seeing Stipe fight Derek Lewis. But again, I think that that's a great opportunity and a great matchup for Stipe to take on surreal because I think Stipe will see what Francis was able to do successfully against him and continue that roadmap and we all know Stipe Stipe is a former D1 wrestler so I I think that that would potentially work out well for him thank you all so much for tuning in this week we brought to you a new segment with Afterthoughts brought to you by Fat Ninja Combat Gear that's going to be a new staple edition each week in addition to the what I got right what I got wrong segment this week that was brought to you by Colorado Native Company let us know what you guys think. Hit us up on social media. You can follow me, Jordan Kurtz, at Comments from the Peanut Gallery on Instagram. Please hit the like, share, and subscribe button here in YouTube. All of your support greatly helps us be able to continue to keep on putting out this original MMA-based content for all of you out there. So again, please smash that subscribe button down below, and we're going to keep on bringing nothing but the best to you.